live start and we'll join tell me how many people are joining and then we'll joseph you ready came back just now from your place fully charged ha huh? fully charged ha huh? all was still uh, anger of uh, kerala were so then you can't assist man hey take it off take that light off Okay so good morning ladies and gentlemen
in focus. Am I audible? Oh, all join man. Sorry. Okay, so we are going to start the case. So there are various methods of doing it. We can do it uh, with a microscope. We can do it with an endoscope. I generally don't like to do with the endoscope because one hand is gone. So I I do not prefer doing endoscopic ear surgery. So in the microscope, you can do a post oral incision. You can do a end oral incision, endomeral incision. But here I'm going to do a post-oral incision, and you can see that I'm going to start the incision. It's a William Wiles post-oral incision. I go along the groove, so you can see that I go along the groove, and once I go, I just extend a little for the graft. You can see that I just extend that a little bit for the graft there. That's it. Then the next step, so I divided into steps. As you know, all my surgeries are divided into steps. So the second step is using the artery forceps directed downwards. And I separate the tissues. Third step is using a retractor. I put that retractor there. See how nicely the field is seen. I hope it's seen very clearly, Chaitra. Okay, I'll lift the retractor now and introduce the artery forceps. And once I do that, you can see the graph very clearly there. And then the next step would be using a diatomy and actually to Hand is not working, man. Hand is not working. Oh, foot is also not working. I'll cut it. No. This is not working. This is not working. Dr. Rajesh, this is a case of a anterior central perforation. Patient is having a discharge for the past two years duration. So this is a case of a uh, central perforation with a 40 decibel hearing. With a 40 decibel hearing loss, you can see that now the graph layer is uh, clearly seen. So I use a retractor like this. And then the next step is to put the other retractor. I can see how nicely the graph has been exposed. You have the full fascia. This is the full fascia. So you can see that I'm now taking off the full fascia. Very important for me. I don't like a thick graft. This is something I don't like. I like to have a very thin layer of fascia. For that, I'm a little fanatic about the quality of the graft. So I'm just going to expose a little more. 
so that I get a better area of the fascia. You can see that the as we go up, the fascia is thinner. fibers above the fascia. You don't want all these fibers. By just taking off all these fibers above the fascia. Make it as thin as possible. Yeah. No, no, no. Cautery doesn't have a role. The thing is that uh, if you cut the greater auricular nerve, the branches you might have paresthesia. That is there, definitely there. And uh, that's why we published a paper on greater auricular nerve transposition. We do that in some cases, of course. Some patients who actually are very fussy about the... Uh, uh, we tell the patient that you will have a mild paresthesia of the... Uh, Pinna, but we can do what is called the great auricular nerve transportation. Maybe in the next case I'll show you how to do that. So when you make the incision, you see how you have to make that incision. Bipolar or unipolar? Why is it? There are some veins underneath, it's better we don't injure them because they will bleed. Looks lousy actually. When you see that the veins bleed underneath the graft. So try to be as gentle as possible. It's important that you take only the layer of the fascia and you leave the muscle, muscle layer as well as of course some people inject a little saline that's also a good technique so this is all I need to close the perforation yeah I'll just spread the graft and I will allow it to dry so sometimes we just uh, allow it to dry if we think that you know it's going to take some time or else we use a hair dryer so it's a fairly big fascia which I've taken always take a big fascia this is something um, bipolar hey you have to irrigate when I do bipolar I see that's absolutely bloodless, there's no problem here. Okay, and that's actually the great auricular now. I, I actually cut it, but we can preserve it. Hmm. Bye, Tommy. I am going to use the diatomy. Use of diatomy doesn't affect the uh, paresthesia or anything, but definitely wound healing it definitely affects. But it is bloodless. During surgery it looks absolutely bloodless. 
and uh, so we routinely use monopolar Yeah, a lot of people joining in after a long time. This is a Facebook live we are doing after a very long time. Maybe six months or so. So that is it. Now we are trying to get that incision anterior. So until what you should get that incision, you should get it till the 12 o'clock position. That is very important. To get this incision till the level of the 12 o'clock position. That is the most important thing. Hi, Dr. Arvin. They irrigate a little. No more on the black stuff there. So I'm just going anterior, anterior, and anterior. So that's it. So I have done it. Irrigation, please. Action. Okay. Now having done that, now I'm going to elevate. You can see the Henley spine. This patient, I'm not going to do a cortical. Most of the times we do. We don't do a cortical. So what is the criteria for us to do a cortical? We believe in the old technique of Dr. Maharaja, sir. So if... Who? Oh, Dr. Puya. Ola is my very close friend from Italy. Yeah. Yeah. Now can you give me a protractor now? So another important thing which I want to tell you. Yeah. Retractor please. So put that uh, view. I hope it's in focus now. So now you can see that uh, that's the flap. To me, it's very important that I have a very good uh, two-handed technique. I, to me, I think any surgery is all about dexterity how dexterous you are, which makes a good surgeon, of course with the concept. So this Henley spine might obscure my view of the, so I'm just going to build it up. This I always do, if it is the, if it's a big Henley spine, I just build it up, that's it. Actually not a canal plastic, but just a little you know, get a better exposure. Right. Now, give me a uh, elevator. Now you can see how it's opened up the... canal for me. So that's the procedure canal wall skin. So the next case will be a cholestatoma. So you will be seeing a cholestatoma after this. To of course a central perforation. See here, that there is a temporal squamous suture line. See how prominent this temporal squamous suture line is. This is a very prominent temporal squamous suture line. So that also I may require to do. I don't like to have big uh, suture lines, big Henley spine and things like that. And so what I'll do now is give me a knife. So I'm going to now make the incision, that's called the meiototomy. So some people write the corners flap. I, I'm not very fond of the corners. So here we are. So posterior canal wall skin is like gold. This I keep telling. 
So here we are, I'm now making that incision far below the Henle spine. My chin is in suction. Suction should be reduced because I always believe that the posterior canal wall skin is very, 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 very important. It's like gold to me. I wouldn't like anybody tearing that flap or, you know, messing up with that flap. Yeah, it depends only on the status of the middle mucosa. If the middle mucosa is healthy, and uh, if it is healthy, I generally avoid a cortical. I just don't do a cortical. But if it is edematous, then we generally do a cortical. Number two is if they have discharge, recent discharge, discharging your, then we will think of doing a cortical. So that is actually my criteria. Give me the, no, not this. So in this case, of course, we will not do it. Hmm. Wash me. So you can see the perforation very clearly here. Wait, wait, I'll do that, I'll do that. Fine, I'll talk. Come on, don't, don't, don't shake the table. You can see the perforation. So what I do is after seeing the perforation, I give a lot of wash. This is being done under local anesthesia. See the middle of mucosa, it looks beautiful, healthy. So why should I do a... Uh, so that's an anterior perforation, you can see that very clearly. Can you all appreciate the perforation there? I am just going for a slightly higher power. See how beautiful the cooperation is seen. So give me a... Uh, hockey. So this is the instrument I use. The hockey stick. And what I do is I make multiple small holes. And I try to maintain that lap, this is called the lap length, anterior lap length. I try to maintain that a little because I want that anterior lap length. I, I, I really love to have that anterior lap length. Suctions, chinna kudu. Chinna suction kudu. Okay. Suction. So here we are. I am now actually made the edges raw here. You can see that this is the edge. Very clearly seen the edge. So oh, that's a little temporous was there along the edge. Now suction block I and then the Okay, that's perfect. Give me a scissors now. Micro scissors. So posteriorly I don't mind taking more of the but anteriorly, I'm a little very conservative about the lap length, as I told you, scissors, because that is like you know very important for me. Ma, please go my three-hour calm on section. Okay. Sharp cuts, perforation becomes, doesn't become a subtotal perforation. I have seen people converting a small perforation into a subtotal perforation. I really don't know why they do that. To use good sharp cuts, 
and get a beautiful margin. To me, the best instrument would be the hockey and the scissors. Very gentle, and I'm trying to remove that. I can pull with a crocodile forceps. To me, that's not a great way. Okay, having done that now, now I'll give you a crocodile. So a little bit of that is remaining. <laughs> Why the sound is not good? Okay, that's perfect. Okay, that's beautiful. Now you the plasters. So having um, freshened the margins, I'm going to raw the undersurface of the perforation. This side you have the malleus. Okay, perfect. So I have done that now and I'm going to make that incision now. So what kind of incision am I going to do? I'm just going to make an incision from here. So this will be something like a 270 degree elevation of the flap. So that's the first incision I make. I'm elevating it. Give me an adrenaline cotton ball, please, small one. So this is being done under local anesthesia. So you can tailor make the flap according to your convenience. But the most important thing is that don't tear the flap. This is something which is very important. And I love these rosins. You see there are a lot of uh, perforations inside the rosins. And the suction is always behind that rosins. This is very, very important. Yeah. Now what I'm going to do is to go for the uh, posterior elevation. Keep that cotton ball there. That flap. And now I'm going to make that give me a knife. That is the posterior flap. You can see that very, very beautifully going towards the annulus so that's the temporal squamous suture line see I, I don't think it's going to obstruct my view I don't have to do anything big for that right now of course you see how the Henley spine drilling actually helped me in visualizing the posterior aspect of my elevation can you see that is it seen clearly we can ask the audience how many people are watching. Good, that's a good number. But the next case is a very interesting case of cholesterotoma. So always look at the annulus. So some people I have seen is they leave behind the annulus and elevate. To me it's wrong. So here we are now. Now, so there is a person sitting at the head end who tilts the head towards me away from me and things like that so that's the annulus here very very nicely seen annulus see that that's a corda very nicely seen now give me the I use the hockey stick here give me the hockey <coughs> you have any doubts you can ask me this is a straight forward uh, meningoplasty there's nothing big the idea is how nicely you perform it and believe me endoscopic ear surgery to me is not the answer because you don't have one hand 
and so the dexterity is lost. Is I always say even in the brain when I do skull base, it's micro dejection. So we need two hands. So some people say that in first you usually only have one hand. So why not use it in the uh, ear? No, in first you have a debrider. The debrider gives you three functions: suction, cutting, as well as it sucks so and irrigates. Whereas that sort of instrument is still not there in endoscopic ear surgery. Until then, I think this is not the ideal way to perform ear surgery. So endoscopic ear surgery to me is still very, very infantile because your one hand is gone. See how my dissection is. It's complete micro dissection. This is the collar. Here you can see the collar here. So, see that's the collar here. Can you see the collar here? Clearly seen, that's the collar. So, that's the malleus. I can see the mobility of the incus with the mobility of the malleus. I can see that very, very clearly. What I'm trying to do is now to skeletonize that malleus. Very important to skeletonize the malice. See the lateral process. We have a cartilage about it. That cartilage is called the Mahadevaya cartilage. So big guru Mahadevaya, slightly hypermobile malice. I should be very, very careful, very gentle in handling the malice in such cases. See how I'm creating a small gap there anteriorly. Can you all appreciate that? And then gently do what is called the sliding technique. So, so I, I can use the scissors to remove that tissue there. Malice is slightly mobile, very mobile. Give me a scissors now please. So let me use the scissors, yeah, because I don't want to dislocate anything there. Anything done with the scissors looks beautiful, believe me. The scissors is to me one of the best tools in surgery. And uh, the same thing I do in skull days as well. We use our scissors a lot. So if you use the scissors or the knife, there is no force. So most of the surgery looks bad when you pull. So to me, I think, yeah, elevator. 
press stop leave so you can see that that's the flap here see how nicely the flap has been elevated very beautiful can you all appreciate it please I have so the size of the perforation also almost remains the same a little bit more but not a sectoral perforation for sure which many many people I have seen actually I saw a video very recently endoscopic ear surgery and they were actually tearing the whole flap I felt miserable when I saw that video to me I think please please be dexterous while doing surgery not a question of you know shoving a cartilage or something like that but I think the dexterity of the surgery whatever you do you should be sort of you know very very dexterous okay see I'll tell you what this ventilation pathway in uh, you have the anterior pathway and the posterior pathway and all the stuff but believe me all this has come out after the endoscopic ear surgery era and uh, I will show you now uh, I don't use endoscopes I don't uh, use endoscopes during my ear surgery so it all depends on the middle ear mucosa if the middle ear mucosa is like this it's very very healthy then I will not even bother about anything and I will straight away go in and graft this perforation and we have not faced any problems in our cases so okay so if the mucosa is a little edematous if it is unhealthy then you have to think of all these pathways ventilation pathway if the ventilation pathway is blocked how will the mucosa be very healthy this is first first point which i want to ask you so that's it i have almost that's the station tube you can see that very beautifully the station tube see how the mucosa is looking so I'm not traumatizing anything there everything is done very very gentle see the can you see the station tube I can in fact see almost wow see that can you see that or not so such a beautiful view oh, honestly speaking and that endoscopes are all you know I, I really don't believe in all that See how nice the ah, chinna kudu, chinna kudu. The perforation looks beautiful. The vessels are seen over the pulmonary, and this is a, a uh, this is a case I will never even think about the block ventilation. Have a good middle ear mucosa, have block or in the ventilation bad and things like that. See, that is see that the flap has not been torn. This is I always insist when they do I don't want the flat tone at all this is something which is the dexterity of the surgeon which shows okay now I have replaced it very very nicely can you all appreciate that now why why canaloplasty you don't need a canaloplasty canaloplasty is just to see all the edges of the perforation ah. Elevator, elevator. Yeah. So again, I'm telling you again and again. I always look at the status of the middle ear mucosa, and if the status of the middle mucosa looks healthy and good, then believe me, I I will have a good success rate in my grafting. So this is my criteria for now the the the, the, the malleus incus uh, it's a mobile joint so that is my criteria for um, this uh, yeah give me give me the graft 
So I think it's a technique of graft placement. It's a technique of uh, surgery which is more important. So he, and take a thin graft. These are all the things you have to concentrate on. I don't know how ear surgery is progressing. Nowadays I'm seeing cartilage, big thick cartilages being put inside. And uh, I really don't know that the flaps are being torn, the perforations are being, you know, a lot of war with the perforations and they're talking about ventilation pathways. So I, I really don't know what's uh, the present concept and uh, maybe I am a little outdated regarding that. But this is the technique we have been following for a long period of time and we have had success. I don't want to talk about my percentage of success which will lead to ridicules. But you can see the technique. So you can see the technique. I am going underneath the malleus now. See how the ground we go and sit right there and now what I'll do is I'll take this that is a graft lift it across People like Dr. Vijendra will make a small slit in the anterior canal wall. Of course, uh, what I usually do is to keep the graft directly on the anterior canal wall like this. So once I Please read Mirkota's textbook. Uh, give me a gel film. Please read Mirkota's textbook. It gives you a beautiful idea of I think that's the key for success in middle ear surgery. I honestly believe a lot on that gas exchange. If the middle ear mucosa is normal, then there is a beautiful gas exchange in the middle ear and that helps in your, um, your graft take very well. So there is no problem with the graft take. If there is discharging here, if there is a discharging here which discharges continuously and uh, so sometimes less than three months or so then I open up the cortical look for the ventilation pathway um, but then or else I, I generally don't open up the mastoid it's not necessary to open the mastoid for every case so there are only two indications for me one is if the see that there is a little gaping between the graft here and the per, uh, the uh, perforation. So what I'll do now is to lift that flap. See how I can manipulate that flap, the graft. I think these techniques are, I think, the most important for a good graft take. See how I'm rising it now. Lovely. Kept it right underneath the malice. And now I'll place it right there. You can see how the perforation has been completely closed. Can you all appreciate that? 
Now again, I'm going to place a little gel foam for me. If I, I do that, if the handle is actually going right towards the promontory, yeah, give me gel foam. Yeah, I do both. I do both. Basically, you have to create a suture line. So, the better to keep it underneath the malleus or make a slit of the graft and do, you double breast the graft. So, that is a better technique, double breasting the graft. If you keep it lateral, then you, there might be a chance of lateralization of the graft. So, we have seen that happening in many cases. We keep it lateral to the malleus. But uh, if you keep it medial, then the problem is again that anterior quadrant you will have a little. So you have to adjust that by a good elevation. So and also you might have to place a little gel foam to elevate that. So this is something which. Uh, so you can see that now very clearly. And now what I'll do is keep a gel foam here and nicely press against that gel foam. See how nice the perforation is closed. Can you all appreciate that? Never fail. There is no doubt because you kept it underneath the malleus, you kept it all around the perforation. And you see how I'm handling that gel foam also. You're not putting suction directly. Can you see that? How beautiful the graph looks? Yeah. So this is something which is very important. I'm trying now to what is called the iron out the graph. What I'll do is I'll just roll it over the graph. So that I have a very plain layer of graft over which the flap will grow. So the flap is just growing over that perforation. That's it. So you see how the graph oh, can you all appreciate that? Is it so all the edges are completely approximated and I call that the suture line. This is called the suture line between the graft and the flap. I am not sure how the cartilage works. People talk about the cartilage has got the same. In fact, I had a few cases coming from uh, various other places and they had put cartilage and the patient had uh, around 60-70 uh, decibel hearing loss. And he said, uh, sir, I'm not able to hear properly. And I had to uh, actually remove that cartilage, put in a temporal fascia. See, I don't know how cartilage works as good as the fascia. I really don't know. So see, this is the technique which we follow. I think the most important thing you have to learn here is the technique. The amount of finesse you show in your graph placement, this is the most important. Don't tear, pull, pull, pluck, keep some cartilage, then put some perichondrium. I really don't know all that. <laughs> I don't know. This is a, a surgery done. Uh, if you put the cartilage, just because you are scared that your temporal fascia will not take properly, that is why you are putting that. Or else, there is no reason I can see why you will actually do a, a cartilage in the middle ear. In Dr. Mahadeva used to say, don't throw cartilage, don't throw uh, everything. That the middle ear is not for that. So I still believe in Mahadeva sir's principle and I am an ardent follower of Dr. Mahadeva, who was the dawn of biology. There is a question on internal grafting. So, now let me come to the computer, I finished the surgery, let me come to the computer, I hope you saw the technique, very very gentle, delicate. Yeah, Dr. Javed, uh, I can split the to accommodate, yes, that is also there, that's another technique, I do also the fish out technique, uh, so yes, you're right. So we can do what's called the fish out technique also, that is make a small hole and, and then pull the hand of malice, that is there. there. So, so what are uh, uh, we on interlay grafting? See, basically, like right, there are on the interlay and inlay. And in the interlay, what we do is between the uh, 
uh, in the mucosal and the fibrous layer. See, I think there are various methods to bury the cat. I am getting success rate with this. Why should I change? So I have uh, no issues in uh, my inlay type of grafting. So I don't want to change. So if I feel that I have a uh, lower success rate, then I might change into the grafting. But at the moment, I don't have any problem with this at all. So this is a technique. You saw the technique. Uh, just go through the technique again, and you know that you know. Uh, try to find out even a small mistake will not be there. So I'm sure that when you have a green horse, don't keep chewing the green horse. That is not the right uh, way to do it. Yeah, so Kaushyap Khaita. Is there any evidence that gel foam in India can cause future problems or many people advocate against it? Honestly speaking, no boss. I have not seen problems in India, uh, gel foam. Um, maybe, see, the uh, one, one reason why they say that is if you traumatize the medial mucosa, if you traumatize the medial mucosa and then place gel foam, there might be mutualization of that. Here, you see, you are so gentle that you don't even touch the medial mucosa and then gel foam doesn't create a problem. So, if you actually, um, you know, score and uh, you can put the pick on. So, um, if you score and uh, traumatize the medial mucosa, then of course you will gel foam, I don't use that. So, here there, there, there is no raw area in the middle so why not? I mean, uh, gel foam doesn't cause any problem. I'm sure it doesn't cause any problem. So, I hope you answered, I answered that question. Um, if there is a small tear in the middle mucosa, then I might use a very sliced cartilage. So that is something which I do. Actually, Dr. Joseph is actually doing it. I am near the computer. Now, uh, Joseph has taken over his scaling a little gel foam in the middle here. So, yeah, we will always build a wall gel foam in the middle here, especially when 360 flat elevation is there. I didn't do a 360 here. I did do a uh, uh, 270 um, uh, flap. Of course, next case, maybe if I show a same type of time, I will do gel foam, I show And then what I do, if I don't use gel foam, then I, I cut the graft like sort of, you know, I double press the bias. If you put it right under the bias, then that is a recipe of using gel foam, as of Dr. Javid said. So, if you use the uh, splitting technique, then you don't need to use the gel foam. Depends on what technique you use. So, because, you know, the, there will be a caving of the anterior superior quadrant, and then we will always not clear, this is, she says. But Amelia says, always not clear. Yeah, do it, yeah. There's echo. There's some echo, man. Hello? We have a cholesterol trauma uh, with a 50 decibel hearing loss. Hello? Yeah, now I think the audio is better. Amalia? Is the audio better now? Yeah. 
Hi, Lauren. From Indonesia. So we have a lot of uh, people watching us from all over the world. It's nice to see you all. We have uh, Dr. Ahmed from Kuwait. So this is the technique we follow for uh, perforation. We have various techniques. I will show you different kinds of techniques. One is uh, the fish out technique and then a double breasting technique. So, so many different techniques are there. So I will tell you the various kinds of techniques we have. Hi, Dr. Shilpi. Shilpi has joined us. Now it is Dr. Joseph who is doing it actually. Placing gel foam in the ear canal. Dr. Shilpi now is in Delhi. Yeah, Dr. Loren, I can see you from Indonesia. Pleasure to uh, have you again, see you in Singapore and then here. And I hope you are enjoying the uh, program, the live transmission from India. So this is just for all the youngsters to learn. And the next case will be a cholesterol You will be seeing a very interesting case of cholesterol So I hope um, it's very clear that, you know, the surgery is all about being fine, finesse and dexterity. So if you are dexterous, if you are having finesse during surgery, I don't see that you will have a failure at all. Yeah, Dr. Ahmed, it's a pleasure always to be with you in Kuwait as well as in uh, in India, from India. So you're seeing some very nice live surgeries. Today we just thought we'll, we've been doing a lot of live surgeries six months before and I stopped doing it because, you know, Facebook banned me from doing and now again they have let my channel out. So we're doing that live now after a long time. So I think I'll join you in another uh, half an hour with the next case of cholesterol Until then, goodbye and have a nice day. If you are going to join us for the next case, we'll uh, show you a cholesterol surgery. And that will be like, you know, try to do an intact bridge mastrectomy. That will be an intact bridge mastrectomy. Thank you. Bye-bye.